Gord, uh, thank you very much for doing this. We're going to be talking about geothermal energy and its potential at, really is it to revolutionize the Canadian power grid. Uh, maybe give us just a brief overview of the, ge geotherm uh, the geothermal that's dealt with in your uh, report. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I appreciate this. Um, so for this report, what we specifically focused on was EGS, which is Enhanced Geothermal Systems or Engineered Geothermal Systems. These are deep uh, reservoirs that are engineered uh, by humankind, you know, so it's it doesn't rely on naturally occurring subsurface hot water that is specifically located in uh, areas where conventional geothermal geothermal has been deployed. So it doesn't need to rely on a volcano. You drill deep, you drill a horizontal well, and you engineer a fracture network to connect that production well with your injection well, and you flow fluid through it. So that's the, the specific kind of geothermal tech that looks to use engineering to solve a natural resource problem. So if you don't have that naturally occurring hot water in the, in the subsurface, you inject your own and start producing it that way. So that's the kind of, kind of tech that we were looking at for this report. Right. So this is not about this is not Iceland, where you where you've got great pools of of hot water and you can just tap into them and create electricity and heat fairly cheaply. This is all about now. I my my uh, peek into this industry has been through Ever Technologies out of Calgary, and they describe it as using drilling technology and drilling uh, and uh, tubing and making big radiators under it in the earth that then are full of water and absorb heat into through the pipe heat the water and then it moves up and you get this water uh, heat the sorry hot water that comes out the other end and you can either use district heating or turn it into electricity that's what we're talking about right yeah, we're talking about something very similar to what Ever is suggesting. Both uh, Ever is doing a deep closed loop tech, which you just described very eloquently, which is also trying to solve the problem of being able to deploy geothermal in more places than was have conventionally been deployed. Um, this is a slightly different concept, which does rely on the fluid interacting with the subsurface rocks as, as a reservoir, so rather than a closed loop tech that that deep radiator that is just sort of running through the, the drill pipe. Um, it's actually percolating through a reservoir's uh, fracture network. So it's a slightly different application, um, but both uh, techniques are, are looking to expand the playing field of geothermal opportunities and um, stay tuned. I, th I think we'll be modeling something about closed loop in the future, but uh, this, this report focuses just specifically on enhanced geothermal, just because we had a little bit more cost data to, to put the, these estimates together. Okay, that's interesting. So that we have essentially three uh, geothermal talk technologies uh, we've talked about. So there's the Iceland version where you're actually tapping a deep uh, well of uh, of uh, hot water. Then you've mm -hmm. got uh, the closed loop, like ever, uh, yep. where you're putting, building a radiator under the underground. But mm -hmm. I I'm, uh, haven't run across uh, the enhanced version. So um, how you put the if I understand this correctly, you pump the water down into the rock and then recover it after it's heated up. Is that the idea? Yeah, that's exactly right. So instead of drilling as, as uh, deep closed loop uh, technologies rely on is you drill two wells that you then connect uh, underground and that's what completes your, your thermal circuit. Here you drill two wells and then engineer a fracture network between them and then the fluid percolates through that way. So um, some folks that are really making great strides in this, commercializing this technology are, are Fervo, Fervo Energy. Uh, they've been developing their, their first 500 megawatt commercial project in Nevada. Um, so there's been a lot of really good development. Uh, there's a few other players in the in this space as well. Most of them are focused in the United States because they've been investing heavily in this through a uh, coordinated R&D effort over about the last 10 plus years in the, through the Utah Forge um, Living Lab uh, research project, uh, figuring out how to build these cap capabilities, engineer these reservoirs, do it effectively, make sure the fluid flow rates are manageable and, and uh, commercially viable.
Okay, that this is interesting. So this uh, comes out of the uh, uh, fracking, hydraulic fracturing, and shale awesome. industry. That's where the technology was was pioneered. And essentially, you're doing what a f uh, oil or gas fracking company would would do, except that you're then recovering the fluid after it's been heated up. Yeah. So you would be. It's a great point. And and Tim Latimer, the CEO and founder of Fervo Energy, got his start doing North Dakota shale fracks. And and he was reading about EGS, enhanced geothermal systems, uh, through a report that MIT put out of. of Ten plus years ago, and and he said, "Hey, we know how to do all this. We can solve these technical challenges. We've been solving them in the field in the shale industry. So uh, it's a slightly different application. Like that, you're you're drilling deeper to get to hotter reservoirs. You're fracking different rocks rather than shale. You're fracking, uh, you know, crystalline granite usually because um, that's what is the kind of rock that's down deeper in these reservoirs. But it is." re-importing that sort of tech from from the oil and gas industry into developing a different kind of resource and and there's there's some nuances I'm, I'm not a frack engineer but like there's some details on you know what sort of fluids you're pumping down in order to uh, engineer that fracture network um, but um, there's it, it's the same basic concepts at play. And one of the advantages of this geothermal uh, technology is that it's dispatchable. It's always on. It's it's like a a gas plant or a coal plant, a nuclear plant, a hydro plant. You always have it. It's not intermittent like wind and solar, correct? Correct. Yeah, that's one of the major strengths is that it provides base load, high capacity factor energy that can be on you know, 90 plus t percent of the time out of all the hours in in the, the year. So rain or shine, wind or no wind, it's really solid for, for that. And because of that, it's a really good complementary tech for wind and solar, where you wouldn't need to necessarily overbuild your grid with um, larger amounts of, of wind and solar, large amounts of battery storage, multi-day storage, if you can supply some solid base load energy uh, that 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 comes into it, so I I think in the the uh, this new kind of energy market that we're looking at, there's a lot of growth, a lot of expansion. I don't think it's an either or solution. I don't think it's going to be wind and solar or geothermal. I, I think it needs to be both, and it's really complementary and helpful for that, along with the other suite of of energy tech that that we're developing in Canada that. You know, it, I think we're going to need basically all of it to meet the future demand needs with electrification, data centers, and everything that we're seeing is massive growth in, in the demand side of things. Okay, now you mentioned Fervo, uh, which I've run across before, and it is kind of leading the charge down in the U.S. We've got Ever, which is the closed loop, uh, which is slightly different, and there uh, we'll talk about them in a subsequent interview. Um, mm -hmm. Are there uh, Canadian companies that are advancing the technology, uh, and particularly in Western Canada? Yeah, there there are uh, a, a suite of of companies that are that are doing that. So yeah, you mentioned Ever; they're a Canadian company, and they're uh, bringing their first uh, project, commercial project online in Germany very shortly. So they're sort of like the the flagship example of folks that are that are doing an incredible job of this. Um, but there's a lot of um, players that are that are developing uh, slightly different geothermal type concepts. Um, but uh, in in the Canadian space, in the enhanced geothermal space, uh, there's a few startups that are that are developing and looking at projects mostly in Alberta that I'm aware of. Um, and yeah, there's there's a few other folks like the, there's uh, the the Deep Earth Energy Project in in southern Saskatchewan. That's more of a conventional geothermal play that's targeting a, a sedimentary aquifer and flowing through it through that naturally occurring porosity and permeability. So that sandstone rock that's like a sponge that allows fluid to flow through it. Uh, but it, it's still fairly new in the Canadian context for enhanced geothermal systems for people looking to apply what Fervo is doing down south in, in Canada. Yeah, it sounds like uh, this is the absolute perfect timing. We had the budget, uh, federal budget, come out on on uh, the fourth, uh, and uh, there's a lot of support, policy and financial, uh, for a national power grid and for investment in clean electric technologies. 
And it would, uh, based on the work that we've done in with other electric technologies and a little bit in, in geothermal, it would seem like this technology is pretty close to being ready to scale. And that's where it needs to be de-risked. It needs to have policy support while it's scaling. It, and it, so I, I assume that's kind of the approach that you're advocating in your report. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think if we can follow the example that the United States have set with this, one of the things that's nice about geothermal is that it's nonpartisan, it's bipartisan. So there were great tax credits available under the Biden administration and the Inflation Reduction Act. They were maintained through the Trump administration and the One Big Beautiful Bill Act. So Republicans like it, Democrats like it. There's a lot of things to love about repurposing skills out of the oil and gas industry repurposing workforce, equipment, capabilities. So there's there's great opportunities there. I think the other thing that we can look to our neighbors to the south for uh, leadership on is through the development of a living lab, a physical test center. In Utah, they did it at the Forge Project, which was a multi-year uh, research and development project that was joint through, the, through academic institutions, researchers, and the U.S. Department of Energy to learn how to de-risk this technology, learn how to drill these wells, learn how to engineer these reservoirs, learn how to, to flow fluid through them and make sure that it works and, and, and make sure that you can maintain these flow rates, make sure that it, the rocks behave as we expect when we try to fracture them. So if we can apply that in the Canadian geoscience context where same concepts, but there's a little bit of learning that needs to be done to make sure that we can you know, make it work and make it commercially viable with Canadian rocks at light, slightly deeper um, depths, so we're under higher reservoir pressure conditions. These are solvable problems, but they need to be um, de-risked, as you said, to, to ensure that it, it's commercially viable. Uh, if we can do that, build that capacity, then we can really start to scale this technology and it gets really exciting uh, because it's very, very helpful in the, in the grid. Um, this is, uh, Gord, this is, this is great. Very interesting. And for viewers, this is a first interview of a multi-part series. So stick with us. We'll put up a play. Well, we already have a geothermal playlist on our YouTube channel. You can find it there, uh, as well as, uh, other, uh, our energy media accounts, uh, on various social media platforms. Uh, Gord, thank you very much for this. I'm going to enjoy talking to you about the various aspects of your report in subsequent interviews. Thanks, Markham. Really appreciate the time.